Good morning, family. I trust that you are doing well. I welcome you to the Jennifer Wedding Ministries live stream. I want to thank you this moment for allowing us to come into your homes via the live stream. Thank you for allowing us to break bread with you as we fellowship with God and His Word. Before we go into the Word this moment, let us just close our eyes and go into prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is in the name of Jesus. Master, this morning, dear God, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you for who you are. You are God Almighty. You are the God that sits high, yet you look down low on your people. You bless us. You protect us. You are God, but you are also Father. Therefore, this morning, dear God, we want to bow before you. We want to acknowledge your Lordship, your supremacy and your Godhead, because you are God of the heavens and you are God of the earth. Who is that man? Who is that woman? Who is that God that dares to liken themselves unto the living God? You are God even before the foundations of the world. Master, we bless you this day. We want to give you all the glory and all the honor. Master, we thank you for this moment where we can come together to fellowship with you. We want to ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would send the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God will be our teacher, that the Spirit of God will come and glorify himself in our midst. Spirit of God, come and have your way. Come and do what no man can do, because it is not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit alone. Father, let me decrease so that you can increase. I am nothing without you. Therefore, I welcome you, Holy Spirit of God. Come and have your way. Come and send your word this morning. Heal your people. Send your word. Deliver your people. Send your word and empower your people. This morning, dear God, come and do what only you can do. And I vow, wonderful Jesus, you will get the glory and all the honor because it's all about you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, I'm so excited this morning um, to share the word of the Lord with you. I don't take it for granted. And I want to thank my apostle for granting this opportunity unto me to break the bread with you. Um, this message this morning, I believe it is a, a prophetic apostolic voice of the Son unto the Father. And I know that God desires to bring his children into sonship. And the Bible declares in John 1 verse 12 that all who receives Jesus, God gives them the power to become sons of God. And we know that there is such a great desire and a cry in the atmosphere for manifested sonship. Romans 8, 19 shows us that all creation, uh, you know, the entire creation eagerly awaits for the manifestation of the true sons of God. But I quickly want to read the Passion Translation for you. It's such a beautiful version. The Bible says, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. But there's a void this morning that is stopping the sons of God from manifesting. And when I went into prayer asking God for a message, the Lord showed me Psalms 11 verse 3. The Bible says if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now we know for decades the fatherhood foundation in our homes and even in our churches have been destroyed. We have been missing the spirit of the father in our homes and even in our churches. And I was thanking God all my life, my father was in my life. I never had that void in my life of not knowing the father. But not just in homes, fathers are absent. Even in the spirit, in the church, Paul rightfully declares when he says that we have thousands of teachers in Christ. But if truth be told, we do not have many fathers. As he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 15. When I went to the Bible, I was um, reading Malachi chapter 4. And the Bible says that the Lord will send the prophet and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And then secondly, you will turn the hearts of the children to the Father. So therefore this morning, the word of God is first 
a prophetic apostolic voice unto the Father. It is the Son crying out this morning unto the Father. So if you have an ear to hear, I dare you today to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. For the cry of the Spirit is to turn first the heart of the Father unto the Son. We've been hearing for the past three weeks or so. Um, the cry of the fathers unto the sons. But this morning, you know, the word of the Lord is a double-edged sword. So the cry is first this morning from the son unto the father. So I have titled this message, Father, glorify thy son. I want you to turn to your Bible. We will go to the book of John chapter 17 and we will read from verse 1. The Bible says, when Jesus spoke these words, he lifted his eyes toward heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. Now we know that the late Bishop Roy Wallace, he was a father and he was a spiritual system with divine blessings that was contained within him. And as he was running his race, he faithfully invested in the lives of those that he encountered. He made investments in their lives that they will yield as benefit for the rest of their lives. So this particular moment, I would like us to address some spiritual investments and deposits a father can make in the lives of their sons and daughters. And, you know, I want to mentioned this day i think it will be an injustice for me to come to this platform and speak about the late bishop roy wallace he ran his race not in my era so i'm going to talk this day from the basis of my foundation that was instilled in me and that foundation comes now from the foundation of the late bishop roy wallace so we know that every father he must have a building code if he wants to build sonship you see sonship is not something you wake up one morning you come to a man of god or you come to a woman of god and now you declare that you are a son sonship is a building process and i was reminded of moses where god told him you will build the tabernacle but you will build the tabernacle according to the pattern that i will show you now when it comes to fatherhood I believe every spiritual father must receive that blueprint, must receive that pattern from God before they can build their tabernacle of sonship. So this morning, I know that every father, every spiritual father or mentor, you must have that building code. You must have that pattern. I wrote here and I said, fatherhood is more than a title. It is more than a name. It is a function, it is a responsibility, and it is a God-given assignment that was given unto you. It is the role of authority. You see, a father is a carrier of seed. It's a gene carrier, a producer, a founder, an author. It's one that brings origination, and it is one that exercises paternal care over sons and daughters. Now, fathers, I want to speak to you as a son. I want to speak to you as a daughter. I want to speak to you as a child. Now I want to ask you to allow me this opportunity to share my heart with you. As I was breaking bread with God and asking him, what is it that you want me to share? And God said, look what is happening. And he gave me this verse. Now I want to read it to you quickly. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22, there is a conspiracy of prophets in the midst of the atmosphere, like a roaring lion that are ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. Priests have violated my laws and they have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between holy and the profane. Nor have they shown the difference between the unclean and the unclean. They are like wolves, raving the prey by shedding blood and destroying lives of the souls in order to obtain dishonest gain. Beloved, as a son, 
This morning I am crying on behalf of other sons. We are in need of fathers. Yes, we have many teachers, many teachers of the word. We have many pastors, many apostles and prophets, evangelists, men and women of God. But this morning as a son, I am calling for fathers. I am calling for fathers to come forth. The Bible clearly indicates in Ezekiel that many wolves have risen up and they devour the prey. Many have risen up and devoured sons. When it comes to a father, I believe the fathers, they have the role to establish identity in the lives of sons and daughters. So this morning, we're gonna talk about the identity establishment code. We know that the father has governing influence over their sons and the daughters, whether it's in the house or in the church of God. A father has governing influence because the father is the source of origin. We come from you. So the purpose of fatherhood is to first establish the identity code over the son. Malachi or Mark chapter 1 verse 11 says, A voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When I look at that verse, I can clearly see when God declared that over Jesus, he established his fatherhood over Jesus. He declared, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But God did not just declare his fatherhood over Jesus. He also declared the fact that Jesus is his son. He established the identity, his identity as father over Jesus. But he also established the identity of Jesus. Father, every spiritual father, you have to establish our identities. You are my beloved son. It is through the affirmations of the spiritual fathers that we become your sons and your daughters. Now, when a father needs to establish his identity or the identity of a child, it can only be done through the time investment code. And this morning, fathers, I want you to hear me as your son, as your daughter. The price every spiritual father needs to pay when it comes to sonship is the price of time investment. Amen. Time is a priceless yet such an expensive commodity that no one can ever get back when you sow that seed of time. It is priceless but expensive. Every mentee and every son is pursuing the father. We are pursuing the fathers for your time, for your wisdom, for the wealth of knowledge that you carry, for the spiritual deposits that's within you. We are sons. We are pursuing you, fathers. And this morning, I want to submit to you, as we are pursuing you, fathers, we expect you to invest your time into us. That's what we are crying for this morning. The factor that will keep the father-son relationship functioning is the pursuit of time. Amen. Give us your time. We are a generation that is malnourished. You know for fact what's happening in the nations of the world. The Bible says secret or men have secretly crept in trying to pervert the grace and the knowledge of God. We need fathers. We need your time. We need you to build us. And we can only be built when you invest your precious time in us. You see, the son pursues his father for his time. Mm -hmm. Because it is in that time allocated to the son that the father is able to transfer his wealth, his wisdom, his spiritual insight unto us. If I look at my own life, I'm not pursuing a father or a mother because of the finances that they have. I am not pursuing because of the property that they have. But I am pursuing you for that wealth that's within you. Because God has given me the eyes to see that you hold something that is dear. That would be of great benefit unto me. But how can I gain that wealth that's within you if you don't allocate time to the sun? This morning is the prophetic apostolic voice of the son unto the father. This morning the son is crying for the father. You know, I'm staying in Osona. 
And my apostle, she encourages us to exercise and to keep fit. So we have a team there and we also walk and we jog. Then there's one particular area that they are building very nice houses. Some houses, the roofs are laid, the painting, everything is done, done, done. But the Lord showed me one particular house. This house is so beautiful, everything is complete. People must just move in. But the Lord opened my eyes and I saw one thing about this house. There was no fence. There was no boundary wall. And I saw this house isolated and alone. And the Lord revealed to me the significance of a father in the life of a son. No matter how that son is built, like that house was built. That house was done complete, but there was something lacking. Mm. The boundary wall of the father. That protection of the father. That governance of the father was not there. That is how important the father is to the son. This morning, fathers, I want you to hear me. We need you. This morning, we are calling upon the fathers. Give us you. We are in need of you. That is the voice of the son this morning. We need the fathers. You see, the son is able to access your deposits. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. We need your direction. You see, you have been running this race for many, many years. And here we come, the sons. Here we come, the daughters. Here we come, the children. The race that we now need to run. I want to submit to your attention without your guidance. We will fail. And we will fail miserably. You see, the son, when he or she sees that the father allocates time to the son, that son feels so valuable. That son feels so important. And that son will honor you as father because of your investment of time that you allocate unto us. Now, fathers, this morning I want to tell you, there are some sons who are so desperate for time, for attention, for your wisdom, for your knowledge, and it's not every son or every daughter that can faithfully await until you allocate time. Very true. There are some sons or some daughters that will run, that will look for time and for investments somewhere else. But this morning, if you are in that position of authority, if you are in that position of fatherhood, I want to ask you, make time for us. So as to avoid us, to run to the wolves, to run to those that are only there for our demise. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 5 verse 18, the last part, the labor is worthy of reward. Now, Father, this morning, if you do not labor over your sons, and if you do not labor over your daughters, if you do not labor over your spiritual inheritance, there is absolutely no way that the sons will rise up and honor you. In the kingdom of God, it is illegal and it is considered as fraud for you to expect the reward of honor when you don't labor when it comes to the sons and the daughters that God has given unto you. The investment that you as a father make into the lives of the sons, that investment will reap reward for you. You can only reap from us, the sons, according to the investment that you are making in our lives. You see, there is no return coming from the father's side. There will come a time that sons will no longer actively pursue the father. And that is something that we need to stop. We cannot allow that thing to happen. The father is the governing authority over the sons. And the father must ensure that this never happens. Because it is you that must watch over our souls. You must watch over the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. We are your generation. 
We are your sons. We are your daughters. And this morning I speak by the Spirit of God in an apostolic voice. And I want to place this demand before the fathers this morning that you rise up and you take up your position of authority over our lives. Do not permit the wolves to come and scatter us. Do not permit the wolves to come in and pray over your inheritance. God called our son to you. We are your sons. We are your daughters. We need true fathers to arise in this nation. What has been happening in this nation in particular? Where are my fathers? Where are my mothers? This is the cry of the sun this morning in this Namibian nation. Where are the spiritual fathers? I am not calling upon a pastor. I am not calling upon a prophet or an apostle. I am calling upon a father. Father, glorify your son. That is the word of the Lord this morning. We need the fathers. You see, the visible marks of fatherhood can only be manifested over the sons. When the father invests his time, I cannot emphasize this enough. Your time is what we need. God has given us the sons many things that we need to do for him. But you carry the pattern. You carry the guide and the solution that you can give unto us so that we can run this race by your side under your guidance. You see, there's a scripture in the Bible where Jesus himself said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now this morning, the sons also want to say that. If you see me, you will see my Father. Beloved, I've been born again for 19 years. And I've only been hearing Bishop Roy Wallace. And I've only been hearing Apostle Jennifer. This morning I am asking where are all the other fathers? Where are all the other sons? Where are they? To those outside that are looking for a spiritual father, that are looking for spiritual covers, I want to give you some guidelines that you can use when you want to identify a father. I believe the first building code that a spiritual father need to use in order to build sonship is the word foundation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, Paul says in Jesus Christ, I have become a father to you by telling you about the gospel. The first spiritual investment a father needs to make in the life of a son is to sow the seed of the word of God. When you are looking for a father, see the seed that he carries. Does he carry the seed of the word of God? He needs to, he needs to be able to build you with the word of God. The Bible says in Luke 8 verse 11, the seed is the word of God. And we know that every seed is a life-giving principle of an organism. So when the Father gives us the seed of the Word of God, you are giving us life. The Word of God that lives and abides forever is what you give unto us. To the sons out there, look not upon the material needs. Look not upon what they have acquired. Look upon the investment of the Word of God that they carry. That is the sign of a true father. If he can build you as a son with the word foundation. Look not for a man or for a woman that's talking head knowledge, that's giving you his or her opinions. Look for a man that speaks on the basis of the word of God. Look for a woman that speaks and gives opinions that are rooted and grounded in God's word. No man and no woman 
should come and give us their own opinions when it comes to the kingdom of God. Because Jeremiah 51 verse 17 says, Every man is ignorant by his own knowledge. As a son, I have been given the grace and the opportunity to know Apostle Jennifer since 2006. The first thing that I noticed about her is when she is able to make work become flesh. Her life is governed by the word of God. When you come in contact with her, when she speaks about a story, a movie that she's watching, animals on National Geographic, she has the ability to make that movie become flesh. She turns that word into a reality when she shares it. She can take her soccer match and bring the word of God into that match. And you can see, you can behold the Lamb of God in that word that she is declaring. Look for a father. Look for a mother that has the word foundation. Jesus himself said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. When you come in contact with that father or that mother, the words that they speak must be spirit and they must be life. I fully understand and I know that it's only through the agency of the Holy Spirit's enablement that our person is able to make the word become flesh in our lives. She is able to establish the supremacy of the word of God in every area of her life. You see, fathers, your first sonship building code should be the laying of the word foundation. Because when you lay the foundation with the word of God, you are building sonship with that life-giving dimension. The word of God that will not return unto us void, but we will become children that are born again of the word of God. And we will never depart from that foundation that you lay in us. When that foundation is the word of God. Because when we are old, we will not depart from the ways of the word. And we will not depart from the ways of the Lord. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 14. Everyone's work which he has built is the foundation. If it endures, it will receive a reward. I pray this morning that God will give the fathers the grace to lay a foundation as a master builder. No one can lay any other foundation than that which has been laid, the foundation of the word, which is Jesus himself. The word of God in the life of that man and that woman must be the first sign that you as a son or a daughter use before you select or before you pursue any man or woman of God. The word must be resident in them. You see, during the memorial service of the late Bishop Roy Wallace, I heard that he was a man that was passionate about the souls. And this character trait was clearly instilled in and over our apostle. You see, at the beginning of my relationship with Apostle Jennifer, there was something that the Lord revealed to me. And I titled it this morning, The Weeping Prophet. I have seen her throughout these years as I've been under her guidance and tutelage that the Spirit of the Lord, He just opened up my eyes and I could see how she turns into a weeping prophet. And as I went and I inquired upon the Lord what this means, He revealed unto me the importance of a soul. When it comes to a father, is a soul important to the father? We in Jonathan Wethy Ministries, word becomes flesh unto us. The Bible becomes alive in our midst. We see for ourselves how she enters into that position as a weeping prophet, how she stands before God and she weeps for her sons, for her daughters, she weeps for this nation. So to the sons, look for that man and for that woman of God that can step into that role, into that position 
and become a weeping prophet that will call upon God on behalf of the souls that will petition the heavens and call upon holy, holy God for the sake of their sons and their daughters. I have seen it with my own eyes. The value of a soul, that's what she's teaching us. Behold the souls. Look upon the souls. Be mindful of the souls. Because the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all men to be saved, to come to the truth and to the knowledge of God. We are commissioned in this church to go out, to reach for the souls, because the weeping prophet has instructed us. Is there a burden in the heart of the Father for the soul? Don't just run to any man. Don't just run to any woman of God. Look for these character traits. Do they have a heart for the souls? Can they neglect themselves and petition heaven on behalf of a soul? Look, oh weeping prophet. As a father appointed by God, the onus and the responsibility is laid upon you to teach your sons and your daughters the value of a soul because God reconciled us back to himself through Jesus Christ. The value of a soul was so important unto God the Father that he had to send his only begotten son to die a horrible death on an old rugged cross. The value of a soul. Father, can you behold our value? Our value is your sons. Can you behold us that we are valuable? Teach your sons the ministry of winning souls to God so that we can populate heaven so that we can shut down hell permanently. There are too many souls that are in hell. Heaven is empty, my grandmother used to say. Behold the value of a soul. The necessity of soul winning must be a building code that you lay as you build sonship. You need to become an example to your flock. We see for ourselves how our own governing influence, our own governing authority goes out to reach the souls. Be an example to the flock. Weep for the souls. Be a weeping prophet. Be a father of souls so your sons too can be concerned about the souls. This morning I'm speaking as a son. I'm speaking as a daughter. I'm speaking as a spiritual offspring. At the beginning of the years when I met Apostle Jennifer since 2006, 14 years ago, I did not understand many of her ways I was so young and inexperienced. And as she walked this walk with me, it seemed she was mentoring me from a distance. And I couldn't understand what she was doing. I used to think that she's pushing me aside. I used to think that she just wants to be a spiritual covering from a distance. I used to think she just wanted me to be a son from the distance. But as I began to walk this walk, I began to understand some of the principles of the kingdom of God. The spirit of God is so faithful that when you go to him and you ask him, what is the manner of this? He's faithful to speak. He's faithful to reveal unto you. And I was asking him, why is it as if she's pushing me aside. She's just mentoring me from a distance. And God said, the distance is for dependence. I did not understand 
My mind could not comprehend what the Spirit of the Lord was saying. Distance or dependence. You know, the Lord said she would place herself in a position of distance. And that distance forced me into isolation where I myself could become dependent upon God. She has never made herself God in the lives of her sons and her daughters. This morning I'm speaking about my own experience. Distance for dependence. She pushed me into that position where I can call upon God for myself. Where I can have an encounter with God for myself. God used this hard and extreme distance code of building and equipping on me. And it propelled me to reach for God. As a father, you should not behold yourself as an idol in the life of your son and your daughter. Push them to know God. Push them to reach for God. Push them to be silent and know that God is God. Can you stand back in your mentorship and allow them to reach for the treasures of God themselves? She brought that distance code and forced me to become dependent upon God. My personal convictions and mindsets were established because I had to learn for myself to know what God is saying. You see, as she was mentoring me, I thought it was because of distance. Her motive and her aim was to push me to become dependent, to break that human dependency syndrome so that we can become dependent upon God. A father must teach a son self-discipline. A father must teach a son to know God for themselves, to know the word of God for themselves, where the son can behold the glory of God for themselves. A father, true father, will teach his son true responsibility, spiritual responsibility. We are being taught sometimes harsh measures, but it's so that she can build roots that will grow deep, that we can hold on to these roots. That when the winds come and they blow boisterous, our roots will remain firm. You see, many a times we as sons, we do not understand the ways or the methods of those God entrusted over us as governing authority. And let us bear we have heard from our apostle herself how she endured many, many things under her own father. For all these years, she remained faithful. Throughout the harsh measures, the extreme measures, she endured. Fathers, mentor your sons and your daughters so that they can take personal responsibility for their own spiritual growth. It's the Bible that says, each man must work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. As I was walking this journey with the pastor, the Lord also revealed what I deem this morning a sonship ministerial ethical code. We go to Joshua 5, 15, the Bible says, The commander of the Lord's army said unto Joshua, Take off your shoes from thy feet, for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. So Joshua took them off. So this morning I want to talk about the take off your shoe principle that I have learned from Apostle Jennifer. I have always seen how she removes her shoes from her feet so the Spirit of the Lord revealed unto me that this is a sign of a servant. You remove your shoes. You remove your authority and you become a servant. 
So this morning to the sons, God is saying, we need to remove our shoes and we need to become a servant. You see, as she's ministering, there comes a defining moment, if you will, where she just takes off her shoes. And if you are careful and you observe in the spirit, the moment that she takes off her shoes, she becomes a servant yielded unto the master himself. Now that is what God is asking from the sons this morning. That we take off our shoes. That we remove our authority. And that we submit unto the fathers. We need to come to that stage where we can sit down. Where we can remain silent. For we will be fathered in silence. It's now the time for the sons to hush their mouths and to be fathered. You see, Jesus Christ, he was the word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, he, had, he was the word. He had so much word in himself because he was the word. But you see, Jesus, he never spoke. He never performed a miracle. Until Luke 9.35, a voice from heaven came and said, This is my son. I have chosen him. Hear ye him. The minute that voice came upon Jesus, the hear ye him anointing, that is when the son started doing miracles. That is when the son went out about to do the work of the father. So this morning, we have some sons and we have some daughters we do not want to keep silent. They want to run this race ahead of time. But the Lord is saying this morning unto the sun, sit down, take off your shoes, remain in silence and be mentored, be fathered until the father is able to say, this is my beloved son, hear he him. Only when we have the validation from the father, then can the sons rise up and speak the father gave evidence from heaven that validated the son is now qualified to speak in the presence of his disciples the word came from above upon jesus and said to hear he him a true son will sit down will ash his mouth until his father qualifies him to speak so the sons need to take off their shoes they need to submit they need to serve and then only be sent. It is only when the father qualifies the son, then can the son be heard. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, verse 7, without a doubt, the lesser is blessed of the greater. This morning, the sons are the lesser. The fathers are the greater. So the son is the lesser. The father is the greater. It is the son. The son will always be blessed of the father because the father is greater than the son. Jesus himself said in John 14, 28, the father is greater than I. So the son is always blessed of the father. And I want the sons to remember this morning that we will never become greater than our fathers because Hebrews 7, 7 says, the lesser is blessed of the greater. You see, to the fathers this morning, I want to give you John 21. You can read the full account from verse 15 to 17. Jesus says unto the fathers the way that he said to Peter, Do you love me? You love me. Feed my lambs. Then he's asking again unto the fathers, Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Then he's asking the fathers for the third time, do you love me? Then he says, then feed my sheep. God is asking the fathers this morning to feed the sons. Feed them. And to the sons, the time has come that we return to the father because Jesus says in John 14, 28, I am going to my father this morning the sons we want to return to our fathers because the bible said he will turn the heart of the fathers first to the children 
then the heart of the children and to the fathers. You see, as I was running a week, week and a half ago, I was running a very far, at a very fast pace. And the sun was in my eyes and it was blocking some extent of my vision. And that particular day, the wind was blowing and it seemed the wind was pushing me from the front. And I had to put in extra effort to just finish this race, to finish my exercise and so that I can reach the level that I set aside for myself to reach. And as I was running and applying some force because the wind was pushing me backwards, I felt all of a sudden my ankles became numb, as if my shoes were too big for me, as if my shoes were too heavy for me as I was running that race. The numbness spread all over my legs and I just had to stop there where I was because I could not push myself any longer to proceed with this race. I just sat down there and all that I could say was, Father, that moment the Spirit of the Lord ministered to me and He said, there will come a time when we, the sons, we will run that race. Our vision will be blocked. The winds will be beating against us. It may seem that the shoes, this race that we are running is too much. It will be too much for us. And fathers, when that happens to the sons, we want to know, can we come back to the father and just sit under the father again? As I went down and I said, father, I could feel strength coming back to my knees. Strength came back to my ankles. So when the sons are running their race and life happens and we come back to the fathers, sons, I want to assure you, the father will refresh you again. Strength will come back unto you. But you must come to the Father. When life happens, when your vision is blocked, when the winds are blowing, come back to the Father to receive the refreshing from the Father. To the spiritual fathers, I want you to remember the story of the prodigal son. The Bible says in Luke 15 verse 18, when the son came to his senses, he said to himself, I will arise and go back to my father. Father, we want to know this morning, can we come back to you? Can we return to our fathers? The Bible says, as the prodigal son came to his senses, the father was standing at a far off distance already. The Bible says he saw his son at a great distance. And he felt compassion within him. Fathers, when you see us running our race, when you see us falling away from you, can you as a father place yourself in a position where you can still see us at great distance? Can you still have compassion on us when you see us? The Bible says the father of the prodigal son, he ran to his son. The Bible says he embraced him. He hugged him and he kissed him. He approved his son to come back to him. Father, this morning, can you embrace us once again? The sons that have fallen away from you. Can you embrace us again? Can you have compassion on us again? For we need you. The Bible says that Father, he organized the feast. He organized the party for his son that was lost. But now he's found. The Father saw the son. He was moved with compassion. Ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. I don't know why. The devil would want to come and destroy this beautiful love affair between our father and the son. Spiritual father, you are governing influence over us. When you 
pick up the dividing walls, where are they? The owners and the responsibility is on you to help us break the dividing walls so that we do not allow the enemy to come in and destroy what God is trying to build. He obeyed authority over us. On Monday, last week Monday, I saw a picture in my mind of one graduation ceremony. But there were two different groups of people. But everyone was wearing the same graduation gowns. And there was a moment where these two groups came together. They took off their heads at the same time. And they threw their heads up into the air. And it was such a beautiful picture that I could behold in my mind. <laughs> you see, Paul says to us in Ephesians 2.14, Jesus is our peace. He has made both groups one. I believe the picture that I saw that day of the two groups was the group of the fathers and the group of the sons. That God is able to bring us together and make the two groups one. Because we all took off our heads at the same time. And we threw it up in the air and there was unity. That is God's intention for the fathers and the sons. That there be unity. He has made both groups one. He has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall. And I pray this morning, Father, that you break every dividing wall that's between the fathers and the sons. Break it, mighty God. We are all laborers together with God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, the Lord has given each of us our own work to do. The one who plants is not important. The one who waters is not important. It is God who makes all things grow. He is the one who is important. The one who plants and the one who waters have the same purpose. Father, we have the same purpose with you. We want to build with you. We want to run this race with you. We never want to do it on our own. You may plant, we may water. The Bible clearly says none is important. But the one who makes it grow, that is important. For we have the same purpose. We are all laborers together with God. Father, this morning, Glorify your son. Because the sons want to glorify you. You see, I am an ordained minister of God. I am anointed, ordained and appointed by my apostle. You know, when she glorifies me, she sends me out to go and preach. My defining moment when others can behold me and see my mother in me and see my apostle in me. Fathers, I tell you to glorify your sons so that your sons can glorify you. When I go out to preach, they don't hear Pastor Karen. They don't see Pastor Karen. They can see my mother. They can see my apostle because her marks of sonship has been stamped on me and I was validated. Fathers, let your sons glorify you. Heavenly Father, this morning I have much to say. But I dare not go beyond what you've licensed me to say this morning. 
Father, as the sun this morning, I am pleading with you, O oh God, that you would forgive the fathers that have failed the sons. Forgive the fathers that have brought shame to the sons. I have a mother, I have a spiritual covering who has never failed me, Lord. Who has never brought shame to me, O oh God. I am proud to say that she is my mother. She glorifies me, Lord. Won't you glorify the other sons of the Lord so they can be proud to say I have a mother so they can be proud to say I am an apostle hey Lord I am a son I am not illegitimate to God I am a covering Lord there are many sons out there who do not have fathers the teachers out there they fail Lord they don't teach us the true counsel of God. They teach us wrong. But dear God, I am a mother. And I want to use my covering as a point of contact. But then I want to ask you, Lord, help mercy. I want to ask you as a son of God, remove them, O oh God. Remove them, Father, if they dare not be a father of God. Remove them, oh God. The sun is crying out this morning. We need two fathers. We need fathers of the faith of God. Because you are calling the sons. You are calling the sons to work for you. You are calling the sons to run the race. But we cannot do it without the Father. I am a failure without my Father. I don't hear her. My Father, she teach me a word. Father, she does not lie. But the word, she makes me to be old, your word. I can see the Christ. glorify the fathers. Master, I'm all wonderful Jesus. You will get the glory. You will get the honor, my master. I but Lord. I Lord. Our Father is what we need. Father, you have no respect of persons. If you can give me a true father, I know you can give every son a true father as well. You have no respect of persons. How can I be selfish and enjoy my own father when there are sons crying out for fathers? And heavenly Father, to the true fathers that are out there, that are paying the price to labor over their sons, the fathers that labor in the word, that labor in the doctrine of the counsel of God, let them be considered whether you double or dead this morning. I lay a demand before heaven's throne this morning. Look up you fathers, you God, and bless them. And all them, you God. You carry them, Father. You order their footsteps. You take them 
deeper and deeper in God. Reveal the true dimensions of God unto them. Because they labor over us, my master. Of the world. 